on this episode of Skeptico. A guest appearance that started out great. Welcome back, Alex. Good to see you, Alex. Thank you, Rob. (laughs) Thank you, Trish. Thanks to both of you. And then went totally off the rails. I mean, you don't always look at science, uh, Alex. I mean, you believe in Pizzagate, for Christ's sake. I mean, that's crazy. That's totally that's, crazy. That's a great one. In the time in the time that we have left, what do you understand Pizzagate to be, Rob? I don't want to get into it. I just don't. No, 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 no. You brought it up, pal. <laughs> what, what do you understand Pizzagate? Well, is it something against Hillary Clinton, right? Right. And uh, that very much. H- H- OK, Hillary Clinton had had this basement under a pizza shop and she was screwing boys or something. Uh, pedo- <laughs> some pedophiles, sex uh, some sex thing is totally ridiculous. And as a result of the right wing uh, conspiracy theory about this, pr- uh, saying it over and over again, when you say something over and over again, like Trump says, things over you lie and people start to believe it and so some guy came with a shotgun or a rifle into that pizza shop looking for the basement and you don't really believe this do you alex see rob you're you're so incredibly misinformed i don't believe you spew this stuff out like that here's what here's what pizzagate was the emails reference spirit cooking which was very offensive to a lot of people of a kind of Christian persuasion. And then you'd have to understand what spirit cooking is. And you'd have to understand what uh, Crowley, you you know, is the guy who kind of directed that. So you'd have to dive deep into the occult and understand that. And you'd have to have an intelligent conversation. But I want you to I just want you to own. I just want you to own what you said, Rob, because what you said was just not you. You started out by saying, Alex, you believe in Pizzagate. And I've just demonstrated to you that you have no idea what Pizzagate was. You had it all wrong. That's what Pizzagate was. Now, the fact that a guy did take a gun and go shoot up that 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 restaurant and he really just shot the safe is what has become the meme that people like you pick up on and say that's pizzagate some right-wing nut conspiracy theorist shot up this thing it's much more accurate to say what pizzagate was was these these emails that were released in an attempt to undermine hillary clinton's campaign by painting her to be connected to occult practices in well, yeah. particularly what they what really stuck was that she was connected to occult practices right. and satanic practices, and that had a a, a, a dense, a, a very substantial. I don't, we don't know how substantial, but it definitely had an impact on her campaign. Right. So you exactly. just got that and wrong. Stick around. I have a rebroadcast of my interview with Rob and Trish McGregor from the Mystical Underground. Welcome to the Mystical Underground. Thank you for joining us. This is Trish McGregor and and Rob McGregor and our producer and tech magician, John Posey. You can go to the mysticalunderground.com where we make regular blog posts where you can find out about our books. Among them are Phenomena, Harnessing Your Psychic Abilities, The Secrets of Spirit Communication, Sensing the Future, and Aliens in the Backyard. Our upcoming book is called The Shift, Reports from the Mystical Underground. Trisha's new novel, White Crows, is now available on Amazon. Rob has been slowly releasing the audio edition of Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings. Rob. Our guest our guest today is Alex Sakaris, who is the author of Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything and also Why Evil Matters. Alex formerly was a research associate at the University of Arizona while pursuing a PhD in artificial intelligence. He left academia in order to found Mind Path Technologies, a successful ITM firm which was acquired in 1996. Alex began his popular podcast Skeptical in 2007 and has interviewed hundreds of people exploring the nature of the universe and beyond. Welcome back, Alex. Good to see you, Alex. Rob. (laughs) Thank you, Trish. Thanks to both of you. You know, I was just remarking to Rob, he kind of sent me this thing, said, hey, send a bio. And I was like... (laughs) Caught in my tracks, I go. Wait a minute! I'm interviewing you guys because every time, every time we start this email chain, Rob starts sending me these stories, and they're like true stories. They're not like fake stories. Like, oh yeah, I remember the time when you know Whitley Strieber and us were you know kicking around these ideas while we're in 
Mitch Picchu or whatever. And I'm like, I want to hear that story, you know? Yeah. So I, I noticed uh, the titles of both of your books, Alex, begin with the word why. Why? Why? Why is that? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, I think questions are at the heart of everything. You know, the the ethos of skepticos is inquiry to perpetuate doubt. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm always in that inquiry mode because I think that's the core essence of spirituality is to always be always be in the moment, always be seeking, always be trying to understand more. So yeah, it's, I didn't think of it that way, but yeah, I think that's probably the deep psychological answer. Right. Yeah. I have a question for you, Alex, when you travel and meet new people, are you always asking why? <laughs> well, see, I get around What's that by not traveling and not me. <laughs> okay. I found my spot. I right. found my spot here in Southern California, Del Mar, outside of San Diego, and I stay here. I go to the beach with the dog, and I do my yoga, and I come back with the fam, and that's it. But no, seriously, I, so, I mean, I ask why on the show all the time. I ask why, and and I love, you know, I really do in lo love the the podcasting thing, and I think it's so cool that you guys. And I want to hear about how one of the things I want to know is how the podcasting journey has been for you guys because you guys are, are are writers you know deep deep in your bones yeah. you guys are writers and now you're doing this podcast thing and i see that a book is coming out of the podcast so right what's up and with you, that? you did you did the same with evil but see <laughs> no i did that i did it with both of them but kind of the opposite way around see i'm not a writer at all the only way i was able to put out these books is because i had a podcast and i had all these interviews you yeah. guys wrote a hundred books and then you did this podcast i think so <laughs> yeah. what's that what has that experience been like for y'all it's, it's a been different great yeah it's a different mode for us though you know uh being uh you know coming on and uh talking with people i mean we we were doing being interviewed a lot uh when our books came out, but we hadn't, uh, I, I always thought that would be the worst thing to do is have a podcast and have to get people <laughs> and uh, find people and <laughs> do this every week, but eh, we've been doing it. So three years. And now. also John's our facilitator a synchronicity, uh, enabled this podcast. We were on, both of us were on Instagram one night. This is back in January, 2020. And we were talking, I think John wasn't it about star Wars or Indiana Jones, but anyway, one or the other. And then all of a sudden, John says, hey, have you not thought about having a podcast? And a week before, Rob and I had been talking about it, but we didn't we didn't know what to do. <laughs> so along came John and facilitated the whole thing. So thank yeah, you, and, and, and it, 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 well, You're welcome. And I've enjoyed it, too. But it, it all started just because I could not find my old copies of uh, the expanded uh, expanded universe Indiana <laughs> Jones novels, so I ordered them, and they weren't available in uh, they weren't <clears throat> available in EPUB. So I ordered a, another set off Amazon and posted a picture of them on on because uh, I wanted to reread them and posted a picture on Instagram and uh, tagged Rob McGregor and uh, Trish showed up on their account on that post and it all kind of <laughs> went from there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really cool, you know, and I, I would like, and, and we'll see how this flows today, but um, now whenever, whenever anyone says something like this, it makes it sound like you guys are old, but what I, what I really <laughs> want to say is you guys are a treasure trove of kind of this lived history with some really important people that um, I, I almost feel like we need to do a couple of shows on skeptico where you guys just kind of do tell these stories because they're amazing you know like the joe mcmonicle uh story <laughs> i mean Want that, to tell that, that one now <laughs> I, I i do i do yeah. and and because it's a it's almost like a jumping off point for all these things that we might talk about in terms of truth and it also intersects with some of the stuff i've done so uh, right. maybe start off with uh who who is joe mcmonicle and how did you guys get to know him and then you know what what if i'm going to ask that question here's how i would frame it up because i'd frame it up with this thing that kind of rob led us into because i think this is also at the core of this kind of truth thing that we want to, that I really want to explore, I really want to know where you guys are coming from, is that 
like I came at this thing from a totally different perspective. You guys came at it as uh, writers and as storytellers and as, I mean, shoot, you know, I mean, you guys write both fiction and nonfiction and you're collecting real stories and you're making up stories. And then you're also incorporating all these different experiences from all these people. I didn't come at it from that way at all. I mean, I came at it as one, my training is as a computer programmer. There are no stories in computer programming. Your program either works or it doesn't work. There is no everyone's opinion matters. If it if everyone's opinion matters, you have programs that just don't work. And then I came from a business background. We're the same way. You either, you know, make the sale, make the money, or you or you go broke. You know, there isn't uh -huh. kind of in between. And you guys are in a, are in a different world and it's a necessary, and you're on the fringes of that world, but you're doing it in kind of a very, I don't know, in a very kind of interesting way. And then along the way, you've collected these amazing accounts with all these people who are also kind of on the edge of trying to figure out what this reality thing is. Yeah. So with that, I mean, that kind of really sets the the right. stage in a way for who is joe mcmonocle yeah. and well, why did he think a hurricane was coming <laughs> that, that story begins with nancy mcmonocle his his wife <clears throat> and um for a decade rob and i wrote the sydney Ar omar astrology books the series of 13 books a year and i had asked scooter that's her nickname to submit an article so that's how i got we got to know her and then eventually we got to know Joe. And I think it was in 2005, Rob, wasn't it that we went to Eleuthera? Well, we went uh, like uh, two, three other places with them before that. Uh, so we, they became uh, tra traveling partners down to the Keys and right. Eleuthera. Oh, I know. It was when they were in, it was when Joe was reading for Bruce Gernon. Right. Yeah. About what happened on Bruce Gernon's Bermuda Triangle flight. Now, yeah. now, but before you go there, remind people, <laughs> remind people who Joe is, because he right. is like a, a super, in my mind, he is a super important figure in, in this remote, whole thing. Yeah, yeah. remote viewing. Uh, he's yeah. number zero, zero, psychic one. Zero. <laughs> uh, yeah, he doesn't really call him psychic, he's a remote viewer, but it, uh, it's a clairvoyant, a clairvoyant. And uh, he's learned this uh, th through, oddly enough, while he is in the army. Uh, and uh, he became a part of this group that uh, we're doing remote viewing of the Russians and uh, all kinds of different spy type things in the uh, mid 80s uh, for about 17 years. And then they, they said, all of them wanted to remote view UFOs. <laughs> they started <laughs> getting into that as well. And but then explain, he, he was married to Scooter whose stepfather was Robert Monroe. Right, so yeah, he so had that's the another- So Monroe Institute, that, that was- Yeah, there. right, and he's, he's been at the Monroe Institute many times as a speaker and a, a leader, workshop Teaches leader. workshops. Right, and uh, so- And one other, th a couple other things to add before you get to the hurricane story, because it sets it up in a way. So I, I talked to uh, I talked to Joe on this show, and uh, because I've always been very interested in the MK Ultra stuff, you know, and a lot of people forget that the remote viewing project, Russell Targ, Hal Putoff, Stanford Research Institute, was under the very very nefarious MK Ultra, where they were doing these just horrible things to people and uh, probably killing people, but certainly destroying people's lives, erasing their brains and doing all these other just ridiculously insane experiments on people in order to manipulate their consciousness. Well, there were 150 MK Ultra programs, so not all of them can be painted with the same brush. And certainly the Stargate program, which was the remote viewing program, seems by all accounts that's one they always want to lead with because it seems kind of a white knight thing you know let's just do remote psychic spying on the russians but what i always thought was interesting about joe's story is he tell me that he told me the story about like he is in uh looks like out of a spy movie he's on the east german west german border at this restaurant he said where all the spies would go you know and he was there having lunch 
and he starts feeling sick and he realizes he's been poisoned. <clears throat> and he starts staggering to the door thinking he's going to die. And he does die. He dies right there as he's exiting the restaurant. A couple of his buddies grab him, throw him in a Jeep. All of a sudden he's outside of his body looking down. They go to the Jeep, to an ambulance, to the hospital. He is having an out-of-body experience. He's having a near-death experience. This is his first encounter with anything like this. He awakes from his near-death experience. He awakes from being dead. Clearly he is clinically dead during this time. And in his face are two of his associates, right? His boss, two of his superiors, who are like, okay, what's going on? And he doesn't know whether to tell them that he's just been to the other side and he doesn't know how that's gonna sit with these intelligence guys or what he should do. But the part of that story that I thought was, has a couple of links to it uh, that, that I think are interesting. He says, when he went to Stanford, to uh, Stanford Research Institute for inter to interview as part of joining the remote, remote viewing. viewing club. Stargate. <laughs> Stargate. <clears throat> it was either Russell Targ or Hal put off his interviewing him. They open up his secret file, employee file, and they pull out Raymond Moody's book, you know, mm -hmm. the near death experience book. And he said at that point, he realized that they understood the connection. Mm -hmm. They not only stood, they only, they not only understood what happened to him, but they understood the connection. They understood that this was somehow in some way they weren't able to fully understand at that point, there was some connection in this extended consciousness realm between the near death experiences and between what they were doing. Then one other postscript I'd add to that is I interviewed Ed May, who is really pretty um, obnoxious person. He was, he but ran, a good, the, but a good friend of Joe's too. Great. Cause yeah. <laughs> like when Ed may ran the Stargate program for 10 years, yeah. Ed may, when I asked him about this, he said, no, that didn't happen. Hmm, really? I said, well, what, what do you, what do you mean that didn't happen? I interviewed Joe. It's in his book. He said it <laughs> on air. He said, no, there is absolutely no connection at all between near death experience or between his experience and remote viewing. And wow. then I also asked him about Dean Radin. And he said, he said these, you know, Dean Radin, he said, basically, you know, he's a nice guy, but he doesn't know what he's doing. And then <laughs> later he said, after the interview, he immediately said, Hey, don't publish that interview. And I know people and you better not publish that interview. <sighs> Wow. And of course, I published you. the interview. Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. I published the interview anyway. I mean, he's just Ed May. But <laughs> but I think it's interesting. I mean, in terms of fitting in my larger uh, project, in terms of how there is this definite goal to make you think you are not in a mystical world, that you are That's called a biological... <laughs> well, it's it's also called uh, you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe. Yeah. So just do what we right. say. You don't have any. Exactly. You, there's yeah. nothing more to you. So why are you even worried about all this stuff? You are just there. Get the jab. Shut up. Do what we say. Put the mask uh -huh. on. Do all the rest of this stuff. But the truth so, of the matter is that Joe's out of body experience, uh, uh, near death experience, is probably what triggered some of his abilities. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and. Uh, you know, he also fell out of a helicopter in Vietnam too and survived that. I didn't that know that man had something to do with it. Also, <laughs> it was in that movie, uh, the goats. What is it? The oh, the goat men oh, who stare at goats. Yeah, men who, men stare, who at goats. stare at yeah. goats. He hated that movie. He never watched it. I remember him, you know, like Scooter, saying, "Don't mention that movie to him. He does not want to watch it." <laughs> so, so that's that. That to me, that's who Joe McMonagle is. Yeah. Uh, you know, and now you guys are on vacation with them because you guys like hanging out as two couples and you're down in the Keys. No, right? we were in the Bahamas. Oh, oh no, the oh, first the, time, the, the first time yeah, was the Keys. Yeah, the first That's time right. was the Keys. It was uh, related. I co-authored a book on uh, Bermuda, Tri a couple of books on the Bermuda Triangle uh, with um, Bruce Gernon. And uh, so I, I had Joe take a look uh, psychically and remote viewing on uh, some f four different uh, experiences from the, the book and uh, including 
one involving a UFO experience where, uh, first of all, just briefly explaining who Bruce Kernan is. He explain uh, what you, happened to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if if you've ever seen any uh, Learning Channel, his, History Channel, uh, any of those documentaries on the Bermuda Triangle you'll almost always see Bruce Kernan, usually towards the end, because he's got one of the best stories. And uh, because he survived the Bermuda Triangle and he had a like a time travel experience involving uh, it. And uh, so uh, that happened, I think, in uh, December of 1971, and it changed his life. And he, he talks, he thinks about it every day. He still thinks about it every day. It just, defined his life. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I just got an email from him about the Bermuda Triangle today. <laughs> So, uh, and anyhow, uh, a month after that experience, he was with a girlfriend. They went out on a uh, private plane flight out of Miami and, because the girlfriend had never been in a small plane at night. So he wanted to, you know, it's a romantic thing. He wanted to show her the stars. And uh, so they fly off the coast uh, about 20 miles or so. And uh, one of them says, oh, look at that star in the distance there, that orange star. And they look at it, and it's, it's getting bigger, and orange. It's orange, and it's coming right at them. It's not a star at all, mm. and uh, it, and it's getting closer and closer. And Bruce tries to maneuver the plane to avoid it, but he knows he can't can't do it. And suddenly, boom, it's gone. And you know what happened to it? So Joe said, "What happened is that they were." captured they're abducted now bruce does not like being an abductee <laughs> he wants you know he has no memory of that <laughs> uh but that but that also what, happened on his flight joe said uh, that on is the, on the initial yeah on the initial yeah, right flight. right on the initial part of yeah. the flight where he left uh um what is the name of the island andros island uh uh, and they were they were heading towards the uh, Florida coast, and there was this very strange cloud uh, that looked out like an elliptical cloud that you'd see like uh, ten thousand feet above a up above a mountain. It was just above the ocean, uh, and it's like a huge UFO looking shape about a mile across. And so he goes around it and continues on, and then he notices that this seemingly very calm cloud starts expanding and it shoots out arms on either side and it seems to be following them and, and growing and growing and there so he goes up and tries to get above this cloud and he goes down and tries to get below it he can't do either and then he sees another one in front of them doing the same thing spreading out arms the the arms all link. So he's inside a huge donut, like 25 mile diameter donut. And he uh, tries to get above again. It, it looks like it goes up 40, 50,000 feet. He can't go over it. He goes down, it's coming right out of the ocean. But then he sees this tunnel where the arms are coming together. And he tries to, he says, this is our only way out of here. And his father, who is also a pilot, is freaking out. Uh, so they, they uh, head for that tunnel. And as they get to the tunnel, it starts collapsing. The clouds are spinning uh, counterclockwise in the tunnel and it's shrinking. Uh, all the instruments, electronic instruments go out. Uh, there's no radio. And uh, oh, before, the, before they entered the cloud, they had contacted the Miami Tower and the Miami Tower said, there's no, there's no airplane out there by Bimini, which is where they thought they were. Uh, and they go through this tunnel and uh, because they see blue sky on the other side, they get through it and there's no more blue sky. It's just kind of a yellow fog and they're flying. And then the, the, the instruments are still working, but the, the radio comes back on and say, oh, we picked you up. Uh, we see a plane coming right over Miami Beach. And Bruce says, no, we're out by Bimini. Uh, and he looks down there. The, all the fog disappears and there's Miami Beach. Uh, so. That was the, the timing the on this was experience. way off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you, you know, like, so we've all heard kind of those. There, there's so many interesting parts of that we jump off in so many ways. I have a friend who I 
kind of have a note through skeptical, fantastic researcher, recently got his PhD, is probably one of the leading authorities on uh, precognitive dreams and has chronicled all these dreams. So anyways, we've Andy been talking about... Yeah, well, I, we will, we will, I was going to leave the name out of it because I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> I love his stories. Trish. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Andy. Okay, Andy, you've been totally outed here, okay? <laughs> Andy's telling I can, me this. I can, I can edit that out if we want. You <laughs> guys decide. Okay, so and, he, and I'm sorry, real quick, since I jumped in, Rob, can you, I was worried about audio when we started. Can you tilt your, can you tilt your uh, desktop uh, camera back just a little bit? So you're, so you're, oh, your cat's your cutting off. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Better. A yeah. little bit yeah. more. Okay. Just, a little bit more. Just okay. more. There you go. You're good. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. I was, right. I was disappearing. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Sorry. I'll get, I'm muting now. Okay. So this relates to your story, because this guy, whose name we won't mention, is driving across the desert with his mom, and I think his sister's in the back seat. They see this strange light, they pull off the side of the road, they wind up back in the car, and it's like four hours later, the morning news is coming on. And I go, and he's telling me this, and he's telling me all these other paranormal things that happened to him, and I'm like, you know, I mean, like, I'm trying to be sensitive, which I'm not always so great at, but I go, <laughs> you know, this is a classic missing time abduction story, right? You see the light, missing time, something, at da, da, da. And he couldn't really go there. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's not like he's like locking up, but I just think that's interesting with the, the guy you're mentioning here. It's that there's so many there's so many ways to process that both from yeah. a human level what do we what do we screen out in our ordinary consciousness right. you know suppressed memories repressed memories all that kind of stuff and then is that process being aided and facilitated by these entities who are interfering with or creating that process so yeah. i just think there's a lot to that and I always also yeah I'll just leave it at that we can all just talk about all these stories but the other thing that's related to that I think or I think may be related but I don't hear us always talking about the connection is the implanted memories and I always mm -hmm. think of uh, Ray Hernandez from the free project where uh -huh. his wife is having having this incredible experience downstairs with this eat with ET and he walks gets halfway down the stairs and then he turns around and remembers a very dominant voice, like his own voice saying, oh, this is ridiculous. I'm going to go back upstairs and go to bed. So wow. you pull back from that, you go, well, that doesn't make any logical sense. It sounds like a screened memory. And mm -hmm. you got to wonder if the same thing is going on here when people approach that and you lay it out to them, you know, like you guys do is kind of part of your thing of collecting stories and say, really? That's interesting. And then you don't, there's a missing time, but no, you weren't abducted or anything like, no, no, no. Well, you, you know what I mean? I mean, right. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I have an interesting story about Joe though. We get back to Joe here and Trish wants to tell her story about Joe, but the, the one we were in the keys uh, in Bruce Gernon's uh, he had a, a house down there and we were staying there and we had this, uh, we had uh, our daughter and a friend, and they were out uh, with uh, on a kayak, and they had some diving gear or just uh, snorkeling Scoot gear. It, yeah. yeah, and it flipped, flip, tipped over, and uh, it sank. And they were ah, just 50, 75 feet offshore. They came in, and there were like two sets of it. And I went out looking to to grab this stuff, and I found just one set of goggles, nothing else, you know, I'm right in that area. And so Joe decides to remote view this thing <laughs> which, uh, from the house, you know, I mean, it's, it's very close. Uh, wait a minute. This was not this. Where was this Trish? This was, okay. I don't think it was. A it, it was not at Bruce's house. We, we stayed at a, uh, another friend of our it house. It was Al's in, house. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so oh. this is right. On, on the water that it's, it doesn't matter for the story it's it's still in the keys it's just a different key <laughs> and anyhow so uh joe joe decides uh to remote view it 
and, he, and he's working away and Scooter's saying, don't do it. Joe. Don't, you're on vacation. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and he can't find it. You know, he's, he's searching for, searching for, you know, you expect this guy, you know, super uh, remote viewer number one to nail that sucker. You know, and he can't find and And finally, you know, he's, I must've drifted off or something. I don't know because I was out there looking for it. It's just kind of a funny story. I mean, uh, the, the, you know, that things don't always work as you expect them to work. <laughs> so it's that's, sure that, that's a perfect that's a perfect lead in to Trisha's story. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we decided to meet Scooter and Joe in Eleuthera. And it's a really, it's it's the largest, I think it's one of the largest uh, keys. It's long, or it's long longest. skinny. Long yeah, that's skinny. what it is. And uh, the Andros, Andros is the largest. That's right. And uh, we were in a house and I had been sort of, now this is in the days before the iPhone. Okay, I had like a, a blackberry that was my only connection to the outside world so i was kept trying to keep tabs on this system that had formed off the coast of uh, of florida and it eventually became a, a a cat one so i said to joe and scooter i said well we better i feel like this thing is going to hit here so we need to go get some groceries and so first though we went to the library and i used their computer and showed you know national hurricane center where they had this this hurricane center and where it was going and its path and all that. Now, the backstory of this is I had been studying hurricanes for a novel called Cat 5 that hits my island, Tango Key, that I created fictionally. So I knew quite a bit about hurricanes. So at the, at the library, Joe's kind of leaning over my shoulder. And he says, this isn't going to hit us. I said, Joe, it is going to hit us and we need to go get groceries. You know, we need canned food, we need water, we need blah, blah, blah. I went through my hurricane list. And so finally we did, we did go to the grocery store and got some supplies and we get back to the house and he's still insisting that it's not going to hit. I said, yes, it is. And sure enough, it did hit as a cat one. We lost power, not just for a day. We lost power for the rest of the time we were there. And the rain was so bad that we had to be taken out. Right. Not, yeah, not we, we, but we had to be removed from the house. Yeah, the water was up to six feet in one area, and there was only one road out, uh, and the water was covering the road, and uh, we were basically trapped. Stranded. There. Yeah, and <clears throat> uh, and the the even the toilets wouldn't flush. I, I, we had to take a bucket <laughs> and go down to shore, and I would I would wade out like up to my ankles and put down the bucket, and then a, a wave would wash over my head, knocking me down as I'm trying to get water for the toilet. You know, it was a disaster, basically. Uh, and we'd sit at night with flashlights and play Scrabble. I mean, that was about the only thing we could and, do. Yeah, and uh, then there, there were people, we saw people that were also trapped, uh, carrying luggage on their head and walking in, up to water in their waist past the house where we were staying. And uh, it was, But now, now, wait a minute, did, did Joe claim that he had remote viewed it and that's how he knew it or he was just looking over I the don't shoulder? know. I but don't know. That, that's the thing is when you're uh, a psychic, you ha have these abilities, you know, you say things th uh, sometimes that, you know, you expect to be taken as an authority, even though you're not tuned in psychically. And I think that was kind of that case. But it was also a case that he did not want that hurricane to hit us because we just got there, <laughs> you know, and he was kind of wishing it away, I guess. Uh, and Trish wasn't trying to bring it in, but she was being, you know, more realistic about what she was seeing, uh, you know, the, and I mean, the, the National Hurricane the Center knows that they know their business, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's so so he wasn't remote viewing it at all, but he, you know, but anyhow, uh, that because see, I, I agree. I, I don't think you can really like psychics and remote viewers and they're different, but they're maybe similar. They're not supposed to be on all the time so there's two different no, things one they're not exactly. on all the time right. but number two when they're on they're not accurate all the time and, and i think that's a that's a really important part of it and, you know that's the reason like the reason i originally contacted you guys was uh or one of the reasons was because the interview series you did with uh, preston dennett who's been on your show a uh, couple of times yeah and i said you know this is kind of a process i'm really interested in and that's that how do we find out who's Who's credible? And, you know, it, it, back to this thing, are we about collecting stories or are we about 
nudging towards some kind of truth? Uh, what is our responsibility for making sure that people are being truthful, both intentionally being truthful or intentionally deceiving, or inadvertently being untruthful, inadvertently deceiving, or being self-delusion, delusional uh, kind of thing? It's, it's an issue that I think pops up over and over again. And I think it's especially relevant to the UFO community because the whole story of UFOs, I think, is a story of a very, very sophisticated uh, misinformation and disinformation. And I think in a lot of ways, they should be studied as revealing the kind of tools and methods for the larger kind of social engineering that seems to be going on all around us, whether it's, you know, whatever the issue is, everything is a psyop now, everything is controlled information, and we're like used to it now. But I think the origins of that within this UFO topic are, are quite revealing, you know, because we have people like Richard Doty, you know, and Paul Benowitz, who, you know, where it's, it's open. It's out in the open. We can study what they did and how mm -hmm. they did the misinformation, particularly in a post-disclosure versus pre-disclosure kind of world. You know, we can look back when they denied all this stuff, and now we can look at where it's now an official part of the story. Right. And then we can compare that to the misinformation, disinformation during that period. And I think we, we get a really really interesting uh, kind of perspective. So as story well, you know collectors, Preston, yeah, so as story collectors, which you guys are, what's, uh, what, how responsible is Preston for telling for his stories, him being responsible for his stories being truthful, whether he's intentionally lying or not? I don't think he's intentionally lying. Why I like Preston is he's done so much research and he's poured this research into his books. I mean, Who'd ever think about writing a book about UFOs over drive-ins, you know, but he's collected the stories or what, what was his other one robbed about? Uh, oh, he's done collected about UFOs over various States. Um, yeah. Lots, just in odd 20, places. 27 or 28. But uh, the thing is he just lays those stories out there. He has, very little analysis uh, related to, to the stories and he, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't dissect them. Yeah, he doesn't dissect them. He doesn't uh, question them. He just says, okay, this is what they're saying. The, so here, here's the story. It's, and more or less, it's up to you to whether you believe it or not. And uh, No. Yeah, it's like entertainment. No, I, no, that's not. No, <laughs> that's not it at all. I just re-listened to the interview that you guys gave with him. And he gives he has plenty of analysis about why they're doing it, why they allowed Dolly to pilot the oh, ship, sense, why they yeah. why they don't reveal what they could reveal, how these videos were collected, what he saw. In, yeah, Dolly's in another, his, Dolly's, his latest book is another case. Uh, he, he does go into more uh, uh, analysis about her story. And, well, I've heard plenty and, of other uh, interviews with him where he, he makes all sorts of claims that, to me, just... Uh, need to be challenged. Uh, I, I'm a believer, you know, but the way I process this data in the, the reliable sources is a lot different than uh, Preston Dennett does. And I think when whenever people claim that, you know, oh, they don't, they don't, uh, don't worry about anyone who doesn't believe me because they're skeptics and stuff like that. I, I'm very uh, reluctant to that. You know, I, I, the people that I most respect in this field are very open to the fact that they have to establish what they know and how they know it, uh, you know, the best they can. Uh, one of the guys I really like is uh, Robert Hastings, and I've never interviewed him, but I had a very nice email exchange with him. And he's, of course, the guy who did the UFO and nukes thing for 40 years. Huh. He investigated it. And you guys are familiar with that, no doubt. But out of that comes some very important like data like they shut down the freaking nukes one at a time and they shut down 10 of them and then they turned them on and then they go the wall comes down in russia and they go over and they find that hey the same thing happened to the ukraine and ussr and they activated the nukes and he has all the 
officials from the Air Force and other who confirm that that did happen. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a guy who very carefully goes through the data and then at the very end adds that, well, I am an experiencer and my mom is an experiencer, but that doesn't have anything to do with the way I've constructed this story. I've constructed this story with 140 of the most reliable witnesses you could find. And what's the name of his he, book? Does he have a book? Oh, Robert Hastings. He has uh, several books, uh, UFOs and nukes. Yeah, UFOs, it, uh, UFOs okay. and nukes, UFOs and nukes. This I was a, was this a nuclear base in Montana that they shut down? Is that the one you're talking about? He there, you know, the he really investigated it like he has. There are multiple ones of these. Oh, so, okay. You know, 60s, oh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. There, there are uh, reports of this, but the and it it's super important information, I think, in, in data sets because it says so many things. And I mean, since you got, I can't. I'm surprised. I should say that you guys are not aware of that kind of stuff because I thought it was. Kind yeah, of I'm everywhere. not aware of that one. But no. you know, yeah, you know what was. One the most things. interesting, the most interesting part of my email exchange with uh, with uh, Hastings is um, like uh, Preston Dennett gives this kind of environmental speech, which is really kind of silly, you know, that hey, the ET's here to save us, and you know, he's green just like us, and wants to save the planet, and all this other nonsense. He just has no support for, it and and is not supported by the larger data that we see. And I'm an environmentalist, but I I, I don't, I don't trust. Know, I, what, I disagree with that. I think there's a lot of uh, experiencers who say this very same thing about the environment that that's their message, and that goes all the way back to Betty so, Hill. To Betty Hill. So yeah. so there's a lot of people who say that. You know you know a, a, a direct uh, point on that is. Do you know who Kenneth Ring is? Yeah, the yeah. very out of body yeah. Uh, researcher. Well, he's a yeah. near death near death experience near -death researcher, experience. and right, then yeah. got interested in the out of body and ET. You know, back in the back in the day, like in the late '80s, there were a lot of near death experiencers who were coming forward. There's a pattern of people saying, "I see these." catastrophic cataclysmic environmental things happening and they were even specifically pointing to a date 1988 was the date and then there was a, a researcher in the uk that actually replicated the work with other nde and they were all pointing towards the same date 1988 and of course that day came and went and nothing like that happened so they're really so yeah, there's a lot of those stories, but when we look to ind independently verify that, and I'm an environmentalist, I just don't, I just don't think the data for the uh, cataclysmic global warming uh, science hijack, which has been done, is supported by the scientific evidence. It just clearly isn't. It is clearly a scam. It is clearly an abomination of science. So the truth about the environment is going to have to be found someplace else because it isn't going to be found in the lies that are being Let me ask you a question. Alex, if you have a personal experience about any of this, say a UFO or a climate change or whatever, do you believe your own experience? I think that's an I think that's a great question, and it's really at the core of a lot of this. Yeah, it is because because like one of the things I'd say is that if we're really objective about it, like look on one level, none of this is real. I mean, consciousness is fundamental. There is some spiritual dimension of this mm -hmm. that that makes all of this kind of silly, right? I mean, we're not really doing anything we're just on this little space for a short period of time and then we're it, it appears that our consciousness survives and there is this existence before and after and in that time frame all this stuff is kind of not well, let me really tell you very a story. well let me let me just finish answer your question okay. because i i think it's an important question and my answer to it is I, i'm very i'm skeptical of my own individual experience because the evidence suggests that I should be skeptical in the same way that I said when Ray Hernandez is walking down the stairs and the voice inside his, he his head says, 
there's right. nothing going on here. Go back upstairs and go to bed. Well, should he just, he has to question that experience, even though it's his own experience. If you're a near death experiencer and your, your experience falls outside of the range, let's say, and I've interviewed a couple of people, Jesus, it's all about Jesus. Anyone who doesn't see Jesus and doesn't have Jesus as the central focus of their near death experience, it's satanic. Do they need to question their experience? They do. They need to look at the broader data, thousands of cases that have been collected throughout all these different religious traditions, and they need to say, hmm, I need to re-examine my experience. I don't need to deny it, but I need to maybe re-examine it because it doesn't seem to fit in this broader experience. That's what I think. Okay, here, here's something. In 1987, Rob and I were living in Fort Lauderdale. And we knew two psychics, Renee Wiley and Tony Grasso. Both are very good psychics. But Renee had this voice that was hypnotic. And so one night we're sitting there and she goes, hey, let me progress you guys to the future. We'll make it unspecified and tell me what you see. So I said, OK, this sounds good. Rob said, OK. Tony said, fine. And she started talking and I felt myself, you know, going to wherever that place is when you're under hypnosis. and. I saw myself as a very tall, bald woman living in a dome because the world outside was so toxic. It was just that image. So two years later, I run across a book called Mass Dreams of the Future. It was by Helen Wambaugh, who was a psychologist who was known as a past life regressionist. Well, apparently at one point she went to Europe and progressed 20, like over 2000 people to the future. She said 2100, she gave it take. And one of the three scenarios that came out of this was, a, was people living in a dome, just like what I saw. You know, and she said it was because the outside world was so toxic. Well, for me, that was kind of a confirmation of what I had seen. But okay. she, they, she saw like three di- from- Yeah, three, her, three or four different research. options. Yeah. Options of and that the, was one of the of future. Them. One was a pr- more a primitive existence where there was no internet and <laughs> right uh, and the another one was a space station. Yeah, right. Then there was space, some other. Yeah, I think there were just three, and then the dome. Yeah. World. Yeah. So anyway, dome in cities. 1989, my daughter was born. The day after she was born, it was about 1:30 in the morning. They just taken her back to the nursery. So I lay back down and I hear somebody calling my name. Now, I was not drugged. I was just, you know, sleepy. So I thought, well, that's weird. So I sat up. Nobody else in the ward is awake. The door's shut. There's nobody standing there. So I laid back down and I realized that the voice was internal. So I said, I said, so I laid down. I said, okay, what is this? And I had an incredibly vivid image of my daughter or a granddaughter at some point in the future. And Megan or whoever this was said, I need to know what you all were doing when I was born. Where did you live? I need all the facts. What time was I born? You know, all this kind of stuff. So I said, why? And she said, because all the records had been destroyed. I thought, oh, okay. So I gave her the information she asked for, and then I, that was it. But that was like another piece of that same progression that Renee had done in 1987. But that's what it felt like. But none of right. So, are there any reasons? Are there any reasons to be uh, to consider alternatives to that reality that you saw, or the precognitive experience? Are there anyone who's had a precognitive experience that's different from yours? That then we would have to kind of say, well, gee, one has to be right, one has to be wrong, or there has to be these multiple timelines, which is kind of impossible to go on. And you know, I can. Ian McCormick is the guy who had the near death experience. And he's, it's all about Jesus. And if it's not about mm-hmm. Jesus, it's about Satan. So, and he's sure of that. He's de- He was dead. As a matter of fact, he was really dead. He got bit by or <laughs> stung by, uh, no, he really was by uh, box jellyfish, you know, highly oh toxic. And like seven times, he was in the morgue. He was in the morgue for like a couple hours in this little uh-huh. island. So he was really there and he went and saw Jesus and Jesus told him all these things. So. So who, who do I trust? Is- who do I trust? Do I trust Ian? He saw Jesus, or do uh-huh. I trust Trish? I mean, you didn't see yeah. Jesus on this, did you? Jesus <laughs> no. didn't tell you that. Oh, okay. Well, but then I'm we got to go with Ian, either. right? 
<laughs> oh, but we got to go with Ian. We got to go with his story. He's a Christian, right? That's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. well, why, you, we have to sort this out. And then I'm telling yeah, you, I Ken Ring, you Ken Ring had all these near-death experiences come back and said 1988 is the end of the world. Yeah, right? I don't know. You know, it's but this is something that has perplexed me my whole life. You know, it's it's like, okay, do you if you have an experience, do you disbelieve your own experience? Yes, That's the whole be, very, thing. Yeah. be very suspicious, be very skeptical of your own experience. <laughs> it's just an experience. It's just the chattering of your little mind up there that we all have. Okay, Do, let, me, let, me, let, let me tell you another story. Uh, <laughs> when Trish and, this is when Trish and I first met. Uh, I, we, we found out we both had this very similar interest in the paranormal, and we were both involved in lives where nobody around us had any interest in that. Uh, we were both uh, reading these uh, Jane Roberts, Seth books, but nobody else was, and nobody had any interest in these books. And then we found when I, I met her uh, that we had that, that in common. And so uh, shortly after I met her, I said, have you ever tried a Ouija board? Uh, let's, let's pick one up and just see what happens. So we did. And we got we got this message to that it was coming from a UFO and that we should go to the airport and uh, there would be uh, a ship would be visible. This uh, we Trish was living in Fort Lauderdale. I was in Hollywood, so uh, it, it was like one o'clock in the morning. We went out there and we sat out there for uh, twelve thirty to. Uh, we sat out there for over an hour, you know, and looking up. Uh, there's, there's no UFOs here. There's this, this uh, message must, you know, this must be a trickster of some sort. So the next morning I have to get up really early uh, and uh, I'm working at a newspaper and I have this deadline this uh, some kind of school board event was going on. And I had to call it in uh, at like nine 30 or so. And then I, I had to rush back to the office and follow up on it and continue uh, fill out the story. And as I finished, the person on the next desk uh, just was finishing her story. And I look over at her and ask, so what are you writing about? And she said, oh, there was a UFO sighted last night over Perry Airport. Well, Perry Airport is a small airport 10 miles from Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> Where we were. <laughs> yeah. And so that that story, her story was on the front page of the Hollywood Sun Tatler the next uh, the next uh, th that afternoon. And uh, so so that night we go, let's go to Perry Airport and look for that UFO. <laughs> we do. We did. Uh, and there's no lights at Perry Airport at night. You know, it's really dark. There's no UFOs either. <laughs> but as we're driving away, uh, Trish and I are in separate cars and I, I turn on the radio and there's an old fashion type uh, radio drama on, which is strange. I'm, uh, uh, I just kind of gone through the channel. So I started listening. And it's about an alien. An alien is talking in this, in this story, and you know, it's just uh, like a, a weird synchronicity. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, we we t uh, years ago we told this to a, a ufologist, who's very into it, and he said, "Well, you didn't see any UFOs, you didn't meet any aliens, so that's really not a story." <laughs> 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 but it's very much of a paranormal psychic event, you know. It's that, very that much related. a synchronicity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. We have no idea. I mean, the, what, the, what the relationship is with uh, synchronicities, with out-of-body experiences, with shamanic experiences, with yeah. near-death experiences, we all have, all have this sense that it's connected. But I think this issue of truth is going to keep going to keep coming up. And I think it is central to how we move forward. And I, I just don't think we can like again, and, and I really mean this sincerely, what I was saying at the beginning, I, I'd like to explore this more because you guys are coming at this from a different perspective, mm -hmm. which is a very, very valid perspective. It is your, and it's also your lived experience. You guys are storytellers. So I can come on pretty strong because I'm trying to jar you out of that mindset because that is not my mindset. I am not uh -huh. interested in people's stories. I don't give a shit about your story. <laughs> I want, I'm want. i under this fantasy that I can move towards something closer to what we would call truth. So how do you see that playing out? How do you see that drama playing out? Because you guys are also, you know, 
news reporters. I mean, do you understand that you have to get the story right? It has to be truthful. Right. How is what's that dynamic? What's that push and pull? See, you know, I, I pushed pretty hard on Preston Dennett trying to get a reaction out of you guys. Well, the thing is, what you're talking about is what's why the world is so screwed up now, because there's so much disinformation about everything. And so the United States, the people are just totally divided. Twas what's ever truth? thus. Tw is there a time <laughs> when it wasn't? Well, now it well, really I always is. Point, I, I always, no, I, really? You know, I always point well, out I the, think so the, much more. I don't know. You know, 50 the, years, the, 50 years ago, uh, during the uh, uh, time when people were really divide, divided again, uh, this was uh, was the same thing. It was uh, kind of the, the hippie era and the leftists uh, uh, and the the, the uh, people on the right were at each other's throats, basically. And uh, well, I always like to I always like to remind people about Gloria Steinem. Right. Mm -hmm. Gloria Steinem, who like we needed a woman's movement. Women yeah. were in a, you know, I think about I was reference my mom, you know, my mom didn't have any options. She's very artistic, intelligent, you know, she right. didn't have any options. She thought she could do and it led to some really bad things in her life because she couldn't, you know, express herself. I think that's part of the reason why she so we needed a woman's movement. But we didn't need the frickin' CIA to run the women's movement. Gloria <laughs> Steinem was CIA. And what a lot of really? people don't realize, how can you not I, know that? Oh, it, no, I don't know that. She wasn't just, she wasn't, well, she, you can go look in her own words. See, so in, in the, here's the double thing that you'll get. So somebody outs Gloria Steinem. And then Gloria Steinem has to respond. And you can watch the old black and white thing where she responds, she goes, yes, I did cooperate with the CIA, but I had to do it because this was a too important of a movement. And I found them to be really not what you think, you know, they're really progressive and all the rest of this. My well, God. sounds good, but it's bullshit because the truth is, if you go look at her past, she was CIA before she started the movements, the women's movement. She was CIA from the beginning. She was CIA when she was working with the student movement and then she was interjected into this just like they co-opted the ufo uh movement right so there's all these so, people that, so hold on Peter we got to finish the story we got well we're going to talk about we're going to talk about your story peter lavenda but the point you can't slip off of gloria steinem because because gloria steinem if you didn't know that then you lived through the you lived through that whole era thinking wow aren't things Aren't things really kind of great? And once you no, understand that that's to her. But you know? the point, the point's the same. It's like you're saying, wow, the disinformation, misinformation is so bad now. In a lot of ways, I could say it's worse back then because you didn't even know it. But now, what did she what did she do that affected us in a neg neg negative way regarding the CIA? Fucking Rob, that's the wrong fucking question, isn't it? She was run by the fucking CIA. Why, why would we, why would we, why would, that would be the question. The, the CIA question is, was what interested business, in the women's movement. What business does the CIA have in socially engineering the women's movement? What business do they have in well, what doing that? What was their purpose? That? What was their purpose? Uh, yeah, well, let's go find out. Go ask them. <laughs> but the point, no, you guys are missing the point. The point isn't, that's like saying, you know, what was, uh, what was Goebbels' purpose? Why did Goebbels, you know, generate all that propaganda? What was his purpose? No, the point is that if he was controlling the information flow, then you have to be suspicious. So if Gloria, Ste and then if Gloria Steinem was, was CIA, and if she was CIA before she ever entered the women's movement, that tells the story. You can't then work backwards. Well, what and say, is yeah, the story? <laughs> And what was what she? The story she was CIA. Yeah. The story is she was CIA. The I mean, so is, is so is so is Uri Geller. You know, I mean, Uri Geller works with a lot of intelligence. Agencies. He's Mossad. He was. He was He's he Mossad, right? Right. He, he was doing. You know, uh, his uh, whatever he does. You know, uh, I don't know if it was just bending spoons for the CIA and the Mossad <laughs> or whatever, but he was he was working with them, uh, and you know, I mean, that he was he was hired by them. Uh, and that's one of the ways he became, uh, and also a lot of private uh, people as well in business. Heard him, he became a multimillionaire and lives in a castle. 
And uh, so he made use of his abilities and the ways that uh, uh, that he could. But I don't think he thinks that he did anything really terrible. He was trying to, you know, help help people out. I think maybe I don't know. <laughs> well, I have mean, you ever had him on? <laughs> have Yuri Geller on? <laughs> no, I, I. Well, you you know, like. I, I don't quite understand where, where you're going with that. I mean, the important thing to me in that story is that, yes, uh, Uri Geller was uh, Mossad, he was CIA, and our intelligence agencies were deeply, I mean, try this on for size. Here's where I take that. Our intelligence agencies were deeply, deeply interested in operationalizing, weaponizing extended consciousness. Right. At the same time, they were perpetuating this false narrative among academia that still persists to this day, that there is no such thing as extended consciousness. There's nothing to see here, folks. Don't worry about it. None of that is happening. It's all oh, I just think that's changing. I think that's changing. I do. Can, can I play a clip, uh, yes, John? Yes, play a clip. But do I have the ability to? Um, you, yeah, just sh uh, share your screen when you do okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, here, let's see how I do this. This is from my... And, and by the way, when, when you guys get done, before we, uh, before we sign off, I've got, I've got a question that may be like, it's not related to any of this, but I would <laughs> be interested in getting a response from Alex. It might be, might be a post-show clip. But uh, okay. sorry, uh, after show, uh, after credit scene. Yep. Uh, John Ask away. Hey, you got to, John, you're going to have to allow me to share my screen. <laughs> okay, I think you so. go over to participants. John's CIA. Be careful. <laughs> no, <laughs> D Defense Department. Yeah, DOD. <laughs> oh, man. Is that uh, true, John? Really? That is, that is true. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a software engineer, just like. <laughs> You, so. just like me okay <laughs> yeah. oh then you're good then yeah, you're yeah. <laughs> um let's see yeah i have i don't guess this has ever come up before yeah, i don't before. think it has that's no big I, I i can just talk you through it yep i just i just published this interview with this terrific guy dr gregory shushan who is uh you know oxford college london i mean just very recognized scholar. Hey, see, see if it'll let you now. I just, I just uh, okay. changed the set. Aha. Okay, here it comes. Okay. 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 Here's, here's Dr. Gregory Shishan. I'll just play this. A show about finding truth in science. There actually were a lot of accounts overtly saying this particular person died, went to the other world, and came back. And that's how we know what the afterlife was like. I found, you know, 40, 50, 60 of them from different parts of the world. So that's not in dispute. The idea that for all these thousands of years in pretty much every cultural region of the, of the planet, people have just been making things up and let's instead look at the world through our own sort of mechanistic materialistic scientific viewpoint and say that no it's all culture and it's all in the brain to me that's a pretty limited way of, of looking at the world and that to me seems completely illogical and unreasonable and it's faith rather than science it's people sticking to their predetermined philosophical paradigms rather than looking at the actual evidence and extrapolating from it and a show about spotting scientists who are full of baloney <laughs> we don't have any answer in the Bible what to do when humans are no longer useful to the economy. You need completely new ideologies, completely new religions, and they are likely to emerge from Silicon Valley. Everything that the old religions promised, uh, happiness and justice and even eternal life, but here on earth with the help of technology and not after death, with the help of some supernatural being. What are humans for? As far as we know, for nothing. I mean, there is, <laughs> there is no great cosmic drama, some great cosmic plan 
that we have a role to play in it. Uh, this has been the story of all religions and ideologies and so forth, but as a scientist, the best I can say, this is not true. First clip you heard was from today's guest, Dr. Gregory Shushan, who seemed to be a little bit embarrassed when I said he's doing some of the most important work in science, period, full stop. So in this introduction, I had to pair his quote with one from a science darling right now, Dr. Yuval Harari, who is name dropped by Barack Obama and Bill Gates and Zuckerberg and has sold 30 million books and is on 60 Minutes and is all over the place. And of course, is one of the key members in the World Economic Forum Great Reset. That's just the way it is. But as that quote reveals, he's really not too well informed on science, is he? At least on the science we've explored here on Skeptica. He's certainly not up to date on why we're not biological robots in a meaningless universe. Uh, but we shall leave all. Okay, so I'll leave that alone, but that directly contradicts what you just said, Trish. No, it's not changing. This guy is the lead guy right now in terms of science. And he's saying exactly the opposite of what you're saying. No, there is no remote viewing. That never really happened. Yuri never bent those spoons. None of that stuff happened. I you are a biological. No, that is that's mainstream. Just, yeah, that is mainstream science, is what you're saying. You know. Yeah. And it's not changing. It's not changing. It's <laughs> not. There isn't this big momentum or any. It's not true. No, I'm sad. I'm not saying that science is changing. I'm saying that people are shifting. No. Everybody yes, took are. the jab. They took the jab. <laughs> they took the jab and they believe in global warming. They're, they're not changing. They don't understand science. The problem with global warming isn't that we shouldn't care about the environment. The problem with global warming is that it isn't supported by the science. Sea, level, sea levels haven't risen in 40 years, in forever, practically. Come to, come to Miami Beach. <laughs> No, it's just not true. Go look at the data in the Miami Beach. They've been collecting that data forever. Go look at the data they've collected. No, it hasn't risen. It just and hasn't. The, That's the, the data. Pe the people who That's didn't bullshit. take the jab are the ones who are dying, too. It's bullshit. Go. Uh, I challenge <laughs> no, you. I mean, I challenge, I, I've been challenged. I challenge you, you to you pull it up. You drive down there. Drive down there after a rainstorm and see how it's flooded. That's Trish, not normal. Trish, Trish, when you say it's bullshit, what I interpret that to mean, based on what I just said, is there are people, scientists, I should say, who have for the longest time been collecting the sea level, recording the sea level right. of Miami Beach. They do it in a, as precise as way as possible. That's I right. would challenge you to go look at their data and see if their data confirms your observation, your individual observation of how it looks after a storm. I think you'll Alex, find- That's not well, true. That's not true. It isn't. I'm, Alex, I, listen, okay, one day- That's not true. What's not true? <laughs> what? <laughs> What's not true is that the what you're saying is not true because there is flooding in areas like Alton Road that have never flooded before, and it's scientifically flooding now. yeah, and it's scientifically verified. We hear it all the time. It's there's okay. a lot of evidence. You're not looking at the right evidence. Everybody's well, <laughs> not everybody's okay. stupid about some things, you know, and they're smart well, about here, other here's things. Here's the well, then then what we can what we could probably agree on is that. There is an official record of the sea level that they've recorded probably for the last at least 50 years in Miami Beach. They record it every day. The scientists do. If that data shows that the sea level hasn't risen significantly, then you are wrong and I am right. Because that's the only measure we have is for the last 50 years, they've been measuring sea level and they have the data and they publish the data. And that's the data we would look at, right? To, to answer that question, isn't that what we'd look at? Let me, well, I think if, uh, if okay, real, let's say, let's say AccuWeather says- Don't you have to answer, don't you have, have to, don't you have to answer that question? Is that whether whether or not the official sea level that they've recorded in Miami Beach for the last then why 50 is it years? Flooding? Then why That's is a it different flooding? question. You're slipping no, off the question, No, it's part of the Trish. same question. It's part of I the same I don't know why it's flooding. I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer to that. All I can tell you is your assumption that because some road flooded is not the best no, way it's to not, look it's not, 
what? It's not a, it's, yeah, it's not a. It's a regular occurrence. Right. You know. Uh, you guys, but do you understand? In Fort Lauderdale, you understand? In no. Fort Lauderdale, they're building a. They're planning on building a huge wall uh, to keep uh, f from uh, you know the rising tides from coming into the city. You know, I mean, are, are they just joking? Is it, is it all bullshit? Is it all bullshit? Just because you know, uh, there's certain people that are uh, have uh, a, a different outlook about it that doesn't conform to you know what uh, majority <laughs> of scientists are saying. I mean, I, there's there's some things the the mainstream science say that I agree with, and that's in health, for instance. They don't. I don't think agree with them about UFOs and about the nature of reality in terms of life after death. They're wrong there, but some things are they're right about, and uh, you know, and and health is one thing, and I think the global warming is another that they're right about. Ninety nine percent of people uh, of scientists agree with that. That's actually not a true figure at all, and I can show you where that's. And here is kind of one of my go-to people. She is a climatologist at Georgia Tech University, like a legitimate climate silent scientist. And her name is Judith Curry. And you know, here's her special report on sea level rise from a couple of years ago. Spent 18 months looking. So you can't, like, you guys are not really approaching this scientifically in terms of saying, okay, we could measure things scientifically. And then when you're confronted with that, you kind of want to slide off of that and say, well, well no, that doesn't matter. It's like, it, maybe it doesn't matter in this grander kind of thing that we don't have to kind of care. We can all have our own story and our own narrative. But if we're going to play this consensus reality game, if we're going to play the game of science, then we would look at what we would kind of agree that this is the way that we do it. So if you're looking at the issue of global warming, you could reduce it down to one question. Have sea levels risen? Because it's like- the, the, Ask the polar bears. Rob, do you understand that that's not, that's not scientific? You can what? go what? ask- Why is that not scientific? What? These Why polar bears are dying. You don't, you don't, uh, do, do you, if, if you're, it's like- Have, you, have you studied yeah, what's going on with the yeah. polar bears? Yeah, I, I have, but do you, do you realize you how? A, do you, you think that's a joke? You 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 know you're wrong on the polar bears, and you can go research no, that I'm on your not, own. But I, here's I my point. Here's no, you're not. But here's the point: is that you, you would, if you were going to approach things scientifically, you would kind of agree on certain criteria that you would measure to come up with your scientific hypothesis. That's how science, that's how science is done. It's a controlled experiment. You don't talk about an experiment and then have somebody lob in from the sideline. Well, what about the freaking polar bears? No, you go on one experiment at a time. So it's like the, the no, you're making it sound like our, our, I, what our, we're saying is, you know, something, on the fringe, you're on the fringe. We're not on the fringe at all about climate change. You are very out on the fringe. You know it too. Well, you, no, you would, you would, ha you would have to back that assertion up by scientifically, right? So, like one of the things, like you, you repeated this thing that is completely can about be journalistically. Well, again, I mean, I don't, don't trust know. you. Don't trust the mainstream media, do you? You think it's like, all fake news? Am I right? <laughs> Come what on, are you? Come on. Why are you? Why are you lobbing, <laughs> lobbing these things at me? Like when you said the ninety-seven. We're outing you. We're outing you, Alex. <laughs> we want this on skeptical. <laughs> you, you got it. You'll get it. So, like, if you take uh, Dr. Judith Curry, and, and she also did uh, a great thing on the manufactured consensus thing, the ninety-seven percent consensus that came primarily from a paper published by a guy named Cook. Cook, remember that? Because he cooked the books. What Cook did to come up with that 97% figure is he hired a bunch of grad students to read the abstracts from all these papers. And he asked them to evaluate based on the abstract whether or not that person was for or against the proposition of uh, man-made global warming. That 
see like you're going to throw polar bears in here at some point. But what I'm telling you is the methodology that Cook used in coming up with his conclusions. The reason that's a bad methodology is pretty obvious. One, you can't have grad students. If, that isn't really asking the scientist what he thinks. That's how about all the, all the other. Let me finish. Let me just finish the thought. So what? Okay. So what? Dr. Judith Curry, Curry did, who is a real climatologist, she relied on the survey of climatologists. And she found that the real number is 52% found agreed with the idea that human factors probably are causing are contributing to global warming. So the question then becomes, why was the if anyone can figure it out and i've had you know people like you who are kind of catastrophic global warming people on the show and when you show them the cook numbers and you show them the methodology you go well that's clearly a shitty methodology no one should come to that conclusion based on that methodology it's just poor it's not doing what you say you're doing so then the question is why is Obama repeating that? Why is Bush repeating that? Why is that on NASA? Is like, are they just like, oh my gosh, they didn't know it, you know? No, they're perpetuating it because that is the goal of what they're they're trying to manufacture. So we, this so we don't have any, Alex. So bottom line is we don't have anything to worry about, right? There's no global warming. Everything's cool. Right? I didn't say that. I didn't okay, say that. You, I what said. What are you saying then? I think that if you want to understand these questions, you have to go about it in a scientific, methodical way. You can't just let your emotions carry you. You can't just say, oh, I had a dream and I saw the world collapsing. Therefore, I'm going to live my life as if this, the world is going to collapse. Maybe the world is going to collapse. But the other data that I pointed out to you is true. Kenneth Ring had near-death experiencers say that the world was going to end in 1988, and it didn't. The other thing I told you about the Christian, I, you can go listen to him. Those are his words on the show, right? Okay. People can believe a lot of weird things. And but what really worries me is when I tried to just apply, like, common sense, like down to earth logic that haven't they been recording the level of the sea level in Miami for 50 years? Why would we not want to rely on that data? You guys just totally blew a gasket. No, we can't rely on what we've been doing for the last 50 years. This is new. We got to worry about the polar bears and the roads. No, no, no. Alex, you're, you're that that's total bullshit. <laughs> we're not that dramatic. What we're saying is that you I've lived here since 1963. Things have changed since 1963 weather wise. Just, you know, I don't need to look at science to know that. I mean, you don't always look at science, uh, Alex. I mean, you believe in Pizzagate, for Christ's sake. I mean, that's crazy. That's totally that's, crazy. That's a great one. In the time <laughs> in the time that we have left, what do you understand Pizzagate to be, Rob? I don't want to get into it. I just don't. No, 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 no. You brought it up, pal. <laughs> what, what do you understand Pizzagate? Well, is it something against Hillary Clinton, right? Uh, right. And, uh, that, Very much. H H okay, Hillary Clinton had had this basement under a pizza shop and she was screwing boys or something uh <laughs> some pedophiles sex uh some sex thing it was totally ridiculous and as a result of the right wing uh conspiracy theory about this uh saying it over and over again when you say something over and over again like trump says things over you and over lie again, people start to believe it and so some guy came with a shotgun or a rifle into that pizza shop looking for the basement and you don't really believe this, do you, Alex? See, Rob, you're you're so incredibly misinformed. I don't believe you spew this stuff out like that. Here's what here's what Pizzagate was. Four days before the election, this is uh, Hillary versus Trump. WikiLeaks WikiLeaks released a batch of emails from John Podesta, and the emails were all about this kind of they were salacious particularly about this spirit cooking thing and they were designed that woman was to, an artist it was an art let thing. let me let me finish because okay. you just there's so many things that you said they're just completely not true you can verify well, but here's what you will relate I know to it's not, you're, you're right you you're will, right it's not true <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about pal the the emails were designed 
to undermine Hillary's campaign. They were an intentional operation in order for, for Trump to get elected. That's why they released him four days before. They were an operation to undermine Hillary, to paint her as a Satanist, to paint well, her as obviously. someone that's friendly. Well, don't say obviously. Rob just said it was a bunch of different shit. This is what Pizzagate was. And if you look at the history of elections, they always do these things like four days, three days ahead of time. They don't do them two weeks ahead of time because then they get debunked and all the rest of that. That's what Pizzagate was. Well, when they released those emails, John Podesta's emails, there was this uh, public kind of uh, you know, it was the group sourcing kind of thing back in the day where we're all used to it. But then everyone on social media, particularly people who were energized in this in a right wing way, started searching through these emails, started looking for connections. So, and they found a connection with a guy who was across the street, this guy named James Elefantis, who ran this pizza place. He ran a pizza place. Well, it turns out he was also one of the 50 most influential people in Washington, D.C., and he was rated as such by this magazine, and he had all these connections to Hillary Clinton and all these other people, and there were some very, very shady things in his background, and he had, uh, he had they trolled through his Instagram, and they found all this kind of soft kitty porn stuff that he was commenting on and doing all the rest of this stuff. The point is, it was extremely- What did Hillary Clinton have to do with all of that? Nothing. You're missing the point, Rob. I'm giving you <laughs> facts and you're missing the point. That is you're the point. missing the point, Rob. The point is it was effective at undermining Hillary's campaign. It was effective at being one of the contributing factors. But it was a lie. It was a lie. Don't you agree? Again, Rob. <laughs> Rob, get a grip, it didn't dude. Happen. The e the emails were real. They, no one ever denied John Podesta never came out and said, those aren't my emails. I never sent those emails. I never received those emails. Those emails were in fact true and accurate. The interpretation that people made about those emails, particularly people in, in the Christian, I'm not Christian, people in the Christian right, the, the, their, outra their outrage over their emails are a separate thing. But again, you, you're you're just wrong, Rob. They weren't a lie. They were real emails, and they really did inspire a lot of people to vote against Hillary Clinton. That whole operation was called they, okay. Pizzagate, okay. Rob. Okay. So, That's so, what Pizzagate was. Hang on, hang on a second, because because <laughs> okay. we're way off track, and we're never we're not going to go. We're not going. We're not going to resolve any of this. Uh, so, well, we so can totally maybe, resolve it. That's yeah, yeah, just well, factual. Well, Anyone well, can go look yeah, that up. Well, well, no, 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 no. I'm just saying that between the three of you, we're not going to resolve this. <laughs> I yeah. don't think you can yeah. pull no, the plug I, I that think, quickly. I, th I think we can both agree, uh, all of us agree, that there was no basement below the pizza shop so you're wrong on all the other stuff you said and now you're going to lay something else on because you're that, so that, well informed you're going to tell us this next part so tell us the next part that you know that there below there is no basement first of all below the pizza i th i think the pizza shop i think we can agree with that so there were no pedophiles and hillary clinton had nothing to do with it. i think we can all agree with that I, I, I'm just going off of the facts that we have. That do you disagree with anything? Do you disagree with anything that I've said? Do you disagree with anything that I've said? Do you disagree with anything? Yeah, there, the there was, there was, the, yeah. Podesta had emails. So what? And there was this art show that related to this thing you're talking about. Yeah, I agree. But you're. Uh, People, it's been exploited basically for the election. You're right. I agree. Okay, okay John. So the emails, <laughs> the emails reference spirit cooking, which was very offensive to a lot of people of a kind of Christian persuasion. Yeah, and then just, you'd have to understand what spirit cooking is, and you'd have to understand what uh, Crowley, you, you know, is the guy who kind of directed that. So right. you'd have to dive deep into the occult and understand that and before you'd have we could to have an intelligent the, conversation. But I want you to, to I just want you to own. Woman. 
I just want you to own what you said, Rob, because what you said was just not, you, you started out by saying, Alex, you believe in Pizzagate. And I've just demonstrated to you that you have no idea what Pizzagate was. You had it all wrong. That's what Pizzagate was. Now, the fact that a guy did take a gun and go shoot up that, that, that restaurant, and he really just shot the safe, is what has become the meme that people like you pick up on and say, that's Pizzagate, some right wing nut conspiracy theorist shot up this thing. It's much more accurate to say what Pizzagate was, was these, these emails that were released in an attempt to undermine Hillary Clinton's campaign by painting her to be connected to occult okay. practices in well, yeah. particularly what they what really stuck was that she was connected to occult practices right. and satanic practices, and that had a a, a, a dense a, a very substantial. I don't, we don't know how substantial, but it definitely had an impact on her campaign. Right. So you exactly. just got that and, wrong. And so, so when you say you believe in Pizzagate, then you, that would mean that you believe all of this stuff about Hillary Clinton, right? No, Rob, I just told you what Pizzagate is. Go back and look it up. That's what Pizzagate originally was. You had it wrong. So you had it wrong. I had it right. That's okay. We can move on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm, no, you're not right about Miami Beach. I'll tell you that. <laughs> we'll only know if you send me the tide records, which we've had for the 50 years, and then you show me that it's risen, right? That would be the way to see whether you're right or wrong about that. Okay. You go down there, drive through the flood, and we'll watch your car drown. <laughs> And then oh. you come back from the afterworld and tell me that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. What if I see Jesus in the afterworld, though? Well, <laughs> then that's your problem. <laughs> you get get mad at him because he's really screwed things up on this planet. <laughs> John. <laughs> I'm here. Save us, okay. John. Oh, Save yeah, us, no, John. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I, <laughs> You don't tried, right? You tried and it didn't work, so you're done. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was, uh, I was hoping that uh, that it would tail off, but it just never did. So, uh, but uh, uh, well, my anyway, dog is uh, here. Well, yep. Yeah, so, yeah. So our, do, me, Nigel's, me, Nigel's been uh, up here for ten minutes. <laughs> let me, let me. Well, let me, let me do give. Let me, let me do give one last question. Maybe, maybe, okay. This okay. Will, maybe this will give us a couple minutes that we can, we can salvage some of the political <laughs> talk. Um, so. Uh, so Alex, uh, in particular with your background in AI, I was curious to see what your, uh, take on the Google, uh, developer that got released last week for, uh, yeah, that NDA, uh, claiming that the, uh, uh, that, uh, that the conversation, uh, framework had mm -hmm. gone sentient. Uh, is this, is it, is it possible? This is just Google has finally passed the Turing test or does Google have AI? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what okay so john i was, what is your take on it uh it just uh well i think i think the guy's probably not i, I think the guy's probably stressed <laughs> a little too stressed probably saw <laughs> some things that uh that probably probably it passed the turing test probably it did come across as if it was uh sentiment but i find it hard to believe that google is hanging on to uh sentiments yeah uh pro programmatic sentiments yeah so uh, tell tell folks what the Turing test is. Uh, the, the Turing test is simply a piece of software that convinces the uh, user, or yeah, the user that that they're speaking with a human, but they're speaking with a piece of software. Yeah. Right. So there's this very famous computer scientist, the guy who kind of made the first computer, the guy who broke the Enigma code, and you can go watch the movie. He was a British computer scientist. His name is Alan Turing. One of the things that's really cool about Alan Turing, I think, is that he basically won World War II for us in a way by breaking, cracking the code on Enigma by inventing a computer. And then later he was completely, his life was destroyed because he was gay and they, oh it was illegal at that time. And they forced kind of him to take these drugs and he eventually committed suicide. It's a horrible story, but to think that someone who served his country that nobly, it, it, it would then be basically killed by his country's very interesting. So he said, he said, look, if people, so way back, this is World War II. He said, if you wanna know where this stuff is going, 
uh, you, you're going to eventually ask the question is, could this computer ever be smarter than you are? And that's when he said, well, really, that's kind of the wrong question. The right question is, as John said, could it ever trick you into thinking that it's smarter than you are? Because if it can trick you into thinking it's smarter than you are, then it kind of wins the game. And that raises a bunch of other questions about consciousness, extended consciousness, UFOs, all the rest of this stuff, which is beyond what the computer can do. So when we narrow the question down to the Turing test, like, can you be fooled? Well, anyone who's ever played chess knows that the computer can whip your butt it just without even trying. But the other thing I always point out to folks about AI is that you're already living AI. I mean, if you trade stocks even a little bit, you're competing with AI. If you play online poker, you're competing with AI. If you're those little search engine bots that follow you around are AI. So even the points at which you're already are interfacing with AI are kind of unsettling. So where is it going? It's it's very it's very hard to imagine that it's not it's not much much further along than we think. But I think the the question really is a spiritual question of whether or not uh, what sentence means what uh, you know being human really means becomes a becomes a spiritual question. Because if you're thinking about it from a materialistic science perspective, it's game over. Yes, of course, the computer's going to be smarter than you are. Well, and it, it's a question of sentiments. And that, and that's what that's what that's what our question is. I mean, really, I mean, I don't and I could, yeah, obviously could be totally off base on this, but I don't think we have the neural networks and stuff that we need to have, you know, to even approach sentiments in a machine. We've just got some really, really good heuristics engines that can make get that because a couple of years ago, some Russian programmers actually won, you know, won a uh, UK uh, Turing test, uh, but they but they dumbed down their bot so that it spoke as like a three year old Russian and well, in English, in English. So translated from a three-year-old Russian to English and actually managed to fool some people. But that's that's kind of, that's kind of uh, I think Kirk did something like that in uh, Star Trek to, uh, you know, uh, you know the uh, Kobarachi Maru or whatever. But yeah. Well, and I think it the, changed the rules of the game, basically, yeah. I mean, I think it gets back to the quote that I played you by uh, Harari, um, the new world order guy who is the science darling, right? So he doesn't believe that you are a conscious being, John. He believes that you are a biological robot. The consciousness is emerging, is an epiphenomena of your brain. There is nothing more to you than this biology that's cranking that out. That's how they want to frame things from an AI perspective, because then from an AI perspective, you can never, you will lose that battle. But if you are more, and the best science suggests that you are more, that you are a spiritual being, then AI can never really touch that unless we start hypothesizing that at some point, the silica, the soul enters the silicon and that kind of thing. But that's a kind uh, of different discussion. Sure. It is a different discussion. Yeah. 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 I just, I just don't, I don't think, I don't think Google, I don't think we need to worry about anything escaping uh, a Google lab and uh, and uh, <laughs> taking over the world. I I just that that's and I could be wrong, but yeah. I just I don't know that we're that advanced. And actually, I think back to the fact that we're just kind of some biological computers. Um, you know, we we don't we don't do we don't we don't do a very good job. So so we're flawed in of in and of ourselves. And then we're gonna we're gonna I mean. So we're really that close to being God that we can create a sentient machine. Again, I think that plays into what they're the meme that they're trying to, the paradigm that they're trying really, really hard to advance, which is that, yeah, that's that's what Harari says that directly. He says that's going to be God. God is going to come from Silicon Valley, and that's why I jumped on Rob about the Uri Geller thing. That's the important point about Uri Geller is. <laughs> This, the, the scientists that were working with Uri Geller, they didn't have any of these transhumanist notions that there's nothing more. They were saying, this guy is obviously connecting with something more. There's something more out there. 
but the message for the climate catastrophist like Rob and Trish is no, give us control of everything, give us the technical control and we'll figure everything out. And that's just the, the science doesn't support that. Well, and, and, and to be clear, that's what bothers me when it kind of bothers me that this that this whole story may have been a, you know, may have been a plant, you know, that uh, totally to, to, totally. to, ter to terrify people that Google or Google's yeah. on the verge of uh, uh, sentient machines. <laughs> that buckle are up, over the you know? world. <laughs> oh, yes. One of the one of the things that uh, you said, Alex, about uh, Uri Geller, about the, the scientists, uh, actually blends right in with a lot of what parapsychologists believe that they they may believe in telepathy precognition but many of them including Dean Rat Raiden I believe do not believe in an afterlife do not believe that we are spirit beings well um, I, I maybe, don't know where maybe, you're, maybe Dean I don't know Raiden. where you're getting that from Dean but I mean he published his book on magic and spirits and all the rest of that yeah, stuff so. yeah i know i've read, read the book but i just remember maybe he's changed uh changed his thinking but i remember maybe 20 years ago you know, say from a, a scientific point of view there is there is no evidence that uh that there is any spirit world that the, that life continues the after death. survives and, well, yeah. that, that's no, I mean, Ed is in his book in the, the magic, real magic book, he kind of says, hey, I didn't know any of this stuff before. And now I understand this. Okay, yeah, being he's, called, he's strange, called yeah. spirit. But yeah. I, I still think he's, you know, he's transhumanist. I had him on the show. And I was just okay. stunned that he he's kind of fallen into this transhumanist trap. So that's where I thought you were going. He's kind of of this, hey, maybe we could all just be a hive mind and maybe that's better for everybody and it'll save the planet if you don't have your individual consciousness, if you just merge it all in the one big hive no mind. No thanks. <laughs> the, man and, who fell, the man who fell to earth. Yeah. And, and, and maybe this would be a good place to end it. We'll just all pinky <laughs> swear that in the afterlife, we'll find each other and record a follow-up uh, podcast. Uh, so have uh, a oh, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, right. As above, so below. As below, so above. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank Great, you, you guys. Thank, Thank you, Alex. They're always this fun, is the Alex. kind of this is the kind of discussions that need to be had. So this is okay. the discussion I wanted to have. I don't know what's right. the one you want to have. <laughs> no, this but is it's good. Like, That's good. good. It's truth, this though. Good. You, it, yeah. It's about finding truth. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna send it's you the Miami. I'm gonna send you the Miami Beach sea okay. levels, and, and then I'm gonna you send you a ticket. To Miami to go drive during a hurricane. <laughs> those are those are not those are not equivalent. Those are not the same. Hey, right, but guys. don't but don't turn down a free trip to Miami. You know. <laughs> right. Take care. See right. you guys. Thank, take thank care. You, Alex. Appreciate take it. Care. Appreciate yeah. you guys. It's Bye. Fun. Yeah. Bye now. Thanks to these guys, Rob and Trish McGuire, for having me on. I'm sure this will be the end. <laughs> the end of it. Um, it, it it's. See that? It's unfortunate. It's a topic I'm going to continue to cover is like the truth is too important and the stakes are raised now. I mean, we have to be able to get through this stuff and just really poor logic just isn't going to cut it. And I don't think it should be, you know, kind of a suffer fools gladly kind of thing. I don't know. What do you think? Let me know. Till next time. Take care. Bye for now. <laughs>